And so it's a toothless resolution in its, in its actual sense, but in its movement sense, right? We got a lion's mouth and like a shark's, all of its teeth, right? Like we, this is huge. Welcome to The Craft of Campaigns. I'm your host, Andrew Willis Garces. In this podcast, we go behind the headlines and hashtags, inviting movement storytellers to share lessons from social justice campaigns. Campaigns are a series of collective actions focused on winning a concrete demand beyond one-off mobilizations or election cycles. They have villains and heroes, teams that make plans to win, and activate people on the sidelines. In each episode, we explore one campaign through first-hand interviews for key lessons, principles, and practices for organizers today. On today's episode, our last of the How to Campaign Against a Done Deal trilogy for this season, following Amazon's New York headquarters fight in episode three, and last episode's campaign to stop casinos from moving into two Philly neighborhoods. As many of you listening probably know, not many campaigns have successfully stopped an oil pipeline, and fewer still have succeeded once a company had all of the necessary permits and had begun taking possession of private land through eminent domain. What's more, 10 months after the pipeline had been announced, in October of 2020, there was still no organized local opposition in Memphis, Tennessee, where this story takes place. And most elected officials hadn't weighed in on whether an oil pipeline should be routed through a historic black neighborhood, even though the company had admitted it was, quote, the path of least resistance and intentionally avoided a more direct route to a refinery that would pass through a mostly white part of town. And through the end of that year, when there was public debate, it centered on whether the city council or county commission could do anything to stop it or whether it really threatened the groundwater or not, abstract arguments that didn't generate much heat. It wasn't until a few black organizers who started a new organization, Memphis Community Against the Pipeline, or MCAP, went door to door in freezing weather to find people in the Boxtown neighborhood who had been misled by oil company representatives, or who were refusing to sign easements allowing the pipeline to pass through their properties, that the fight started to shift. The group's casework and willingness to aggressively fight to win the battle of the story generated newfound political willpower in their elected officials, whose attitudes shifted from, well, what can we do, to, we've got to do something. But they didn't pin their hopes entirely to untested relationships with local politicians. They were persistent in seeking out other points of leverage, teaming up with largely white climate advocates and legal strategists to try out multiple approaches to slowing down the oil companies. This is a little meta, but shortly after we recorded this interview, I heard Justin speak to Heather McGee on her podcast, The Some of Us, about what she calls the solidarity dividend, the changes to our conditions that are possible when we build strong campaigns that bring in active participation by people who are working class and middle class and who have different racial identities and which Justin mentions at the end of our conversation. It echoes some of what Mary Hooks and Kate Shapiro talked about in episode four, building campaigns that actually shift the pillars of power, holding up the status quo, often requires us to bring together people who are and are not like us, which is way more difficult than building with whoever is easily within reach. And as someone born in Memphis, a place with a long history of multiracial campaigning, I can tell you, this story is unique. Justin J. Pearson is president and founder of Memphis Community Against Pollution and co-founder of Memphis Community Against the Pipeline, which is a Black-led environmental justice organization that successfully defeated a multi-billion dollar company's crude oil pipeline project that would have poisoned Memphis's drinking water and stolen land from the community. He is the co-lead and strategic advisor for the Poor People's Campaign, National Call for Moral Revival. And a week ago, January 24th, He won a special election to replace Tennessee State Representative Barbara Cooper, who passed away last year and was an early ally to MCAP in their campaign. Next week, he'll become one of the youngest elected officials in the state. And just a note, if you appreciate this story and want it to get out to more people fighting their landlords, bosses, and politicians who just don't seem to care about things like pipelines in our backyard, 
Leave us a rating and a review to help us take collective action on the recommendation algorithm. Justin J. Pearson, thank you so much for being with us here on the Craft of Campaigns. So excited to hear it so live and direct from Memphis, Tennessee. Yes, indeed. Can you please tell us if this campaign that you're going to tell us about, we're a movie, can you give us the trailer real quick, what we're about to hear, what's the movie we're about to see? Yeah, I mean, it's a mix between a horror movie and that super inspirational adventure movie that everybody loves. You've got two multi-billion dollar oil conglomerates coming into a predominantly black, lower income community, risking folks drinking water, taking folks land through eminent domain, planning to build a proposed 49 mile pipeline starting in a community that was formerly created by enslaved folks and saying to the community, we're building this crude oil pipeline here, sending it through Mississippi down to the Gulf of Mexico because we believe you're the point of least resistance. And an entire community galvanizes and galvanizes folks across the country to resist that project in order to defeat that crude oil pipeline. Wow, I can't wait to see this movie, man. Before we get into it and we watch too much of it, can you tell us a little bit about who you are? What's your connection to this story and to Memphis? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, look, I did not think that I would be spending days upon days, years upon years in environmental justice, climate justice in this space and environment. I tell folks I'm an unlikely participant and leader in this work, or at least that's what I thought initially. I learned about this crude oil pipeline during the pandemic. I was in Boston, Massachusetts. I had, and still do work in workforce development, I had done mentoring and organized our community back in high school. I was really passionate about educational justice. We were denied textbooks when I was in high school. And that really sparked my interest in really trying to change the status quo. Now, think about this. The same community that I fought for, for us to have textbooks, was the exact same community that they planned to build this pipeline through. There's something about systemic injustices that I got an early introduction to and fighting it that I also now reflectively realize I had an introduction to as well. I'm the fourth son of teenage parents. My mother, Kimberly Owens Pearson, is a teacher. She's been a teacher for 20 years on her way to earning a doctorate. My dad, Reverend Jason C. Pearson Sr., has been a pastor, got his divinity degree in Washington, D.C., where I grew up for a little bit of time. But my parents and my family struggled financially growing up. But spiritually, we were rich. And the lessons that I learned, the things that I witnessed, just from our growing up, from difficulty to more stability, the strive in addition to the strife, really shaped my understanding of what it means for people to have access to opportunity, to be given resources that they deserve as people, and also uh, what the power of community and village looks like. Now, I applied those lessons in high school, was able to apply them going to a small school in Maine for college. And when it came to this pipeline fight, like I was able to apply them too. But my, my personal connection to this, I didn't learn, honestly, until we were in the thick of the fight. All these statistics started to come out about our community, things that I did not know. One of them was that the cancer risk in Southwest Memphis, our community, is 4.1 times the national average, according to the EPA. And more data has come out about that. I didn't know that statistic. And, and it became so, so, so poignant in our movement that in one march, one of the marchers, she had a sign that said, the more I learn about environmental racism, the more I believe that it killed my mother. And, and I, too, carry a sign in my heart and in my soul that connects me much more deeply to this movement than I thought it otherwise would have. Both of my grandmothers, God rest their souls, died of cancer. Both lived in southwest Memphis, age 63 and 68, respectively. Just a couple of weeks ago, we learned that our life expectancy is 10 years shorter than folks who live 20 miles east in the suburbs of Germantown, a decade. And if their average life expectancy is 78, then ours is 68, which was the same year that my grandmother Gwen was when she died of cancer. My grandmother Pearson didn't make it to 68. She was only 63. And so it was actually because of the struggle, because of the fight, that I started to put pieces together of my own personal identity associated with the struggle. And I, I believe that the more people learn about environmental justice and learn about environmental racism are engaged in this fight, 
a lot of people have more stories, whether it be about asthma or COPD or cancer, than they might otherwise realize. And so starting off as a person who may be unsuspecting into the movement, I started to realize that a big part of my identity has already been shaped by a movement that I didn't necessarily choose, a situation, a zip code that I didn't necessarily choose, but one that now I am actively engaged in because this is the fight of our lives and for our lives too. Wow. Thank you for that. You are clearly in this story, your family, there's generational history here. So thanks for sharing that and, and even how you have gotten to know more of your own story through this fight. Mm -hmm. And you gave us some of the backstory in the sense that you started to tell us about this part of Memphis. Mm -hmm. Can you keep going there? What is the backstory here that led to the campaign, which the ink is barely dry, even on the victory y'all had mm -hmm. a year ago and even into this year, but what led to that? How would you set the stage for the story we're about to hear? The story is rooted in Boxtown, Westwood, and West Junction, what we call Southwest Memphis. It's not just South Memphis, though that's super inclusive of all the communities, including Whitehaven and Capeville, which are also polluted and face that. But in this particular story, it's, it's about what, what really starts, as I call, a whisper in Boxtown that grows into a clarion call for justice that echoes from Memphis across the world. Boxtown, a community of formerly enslaved African Americans. They built this community, and the reason it got its name that way is because they used materials from boxcars to help build and repair their homes. The descendants of those freed men and freed women still live there. But the culture and the, the ethos of that community is still quite vibrant and strong and is the community that one of the representatives of the pipeline company called a point of least resistance, this type of place. You have to think about Westwood. My grandmothers were from where we were raised in West Junction. Majority black folk, $24,000 a year per capita income, not a whole lot of money. And yet 64% of people are homeowners. And so there's a really important component of this, which is a sense of place, a sense of belonging that makes a neighborhood and a community familial. You're six degrees of separation from everybody, folks say. In Southwest Memphis, you like 0.5 to one degree of separation away. And it is that community. It is that love. It is that sense of place that gets folks galvanized, whether they're living in Nashville or living in other places to be invested in the movement that is launched from Southwest Memphis in the environmental justice movement and joins the discourse nationally and internationally. And so how does this get started? We have a historic black neighborhood, Foxtown, part of Memphis. And as I understand it, a pipeline company says we can make some money and we can make it easier on ourselves writing our pipeline actually very inconveniently when you look at the map, but very this black neighborhood. Yep. And where does that start? How did, what, what happens there? When is that? Yeah. So in 2019, you have Plains All American and Valero Energy Corporation who launch a plan to have the Bahalia Connection Pipeline, a 49 mile pipeline to connect from Memphis down through Mississippi, Bahalia, Mississippi, to the Gulf of Mexico for export. And they're going into the community and they're hosting all these meetings, trying to convince everybody that this is a good thing. The project is moving full steam ahead. They have all these permits. They got all these things going, but they're meeting some local resistance. And then they hit a pandemic, which creates all types of chaos. But the local resistance really does emerge out of what's going on in Boxtown. The Boxtown Neighborhood Association is complaining about this project, trying to understand the particulars of it. Why are we doing this? Why are people, why is people's land being taken, right? Like the inquiries are pretty intense and the desire to have this project are not quite desirable. Pandemic starts and the pipeline company kind of goes silent. The community is still reaching out, trying to figure out what's going on, reaching out to State Representative Cooper, State Senator Ramesh Ackberry, right? Trying to like figure out how they can be engaged in this process because people still don't want to have the project. But as what as happens in these types of situations, as you know, and as a lot of the folks who are in the fight for climate justice and environmental justice understand, the pipeline's main tactic is to make folks feel powerless. 
that the deal's already done, that it's already over, and any effort to stop it is futile, right? And, and so that's what was going on. That was the narrative that was being pushed. And with arrogance, they came into Southwest Memphis in October of 2020 after an article propelled them to do so by MLK 50, a local paper with national reach that prioritizes the voice of marginalized communities, excluded communities, black communities, especially in Memphis. And the article is where we learn more about this project and where people stand. And we learn that they're taking land from folks like Samuel Hardaway and the Hardaway family. Anthony Hardaway is one of our biggest MCAP supporters. He's never missed a rally or march. A, a family that's been rooted in Boxtown for 100 plus years, nearly 150 years. And his land and their family's land is, is, is being proposed to be taken all the way to uh, congressmen and, and leaders who are kind of on the fence. They're not really taking a stand. So we, the public, are learning about this. And then there's a line in there that says they chose this path through Boxtown, right? Because it's a point of least resistance. S something else to know about Southwest Memphis. We love where we're from, right? Like you, you love God, you love your mama, and you love where you're from. Because it's the places where we're from that have built us and sustained us. And it's the place that we get to call home. And for this corporation, this multi billion dollar corporation with all these resources to then call out our community as a point of least resistance became kind of a, a, a lightning rod for us to make sure we stood up and spoke up and proved them wrong. And so at this October 2020 meeting, we hear from Protect Our Aquifer, who becomes one of MCAP's closest coalition partners. We hear from the University of Memphis program that studies earthquakes and we learn about how they're building this pipeline atop an earthquake zone and in addition to an earthquake zone they're building it atop the memphis sand aquifer the largest uh, body of water about 500 to a thousand feet underneath our feet that give us our drinking water memphis is the largest municipality in the world to get 100 percent of its drinking water from groundwater and so we learned about the potential risk to the aquifer. And then it was time for the pipeline company. And so the pipeline company gets up in there giving us this wonderful presentation about how good this project is. And it's going to create this many jobs temporarily. It's going to provide this much economic development temporarily. We gave this much money to the uh, organizations like the NAACP and all these things. And then it was time for question and answer. And you had about 20 to 30 people in the community who were saying, this isn't a good project. Uh, you had folks like my mother who were talking about her own brother who was sick, God rest his soul, in 38109, lived in Westwood, majority of his life. And that ignited an entire conversation. And people started to talk personally about why this project would be bad and, and, and why we needed to resist and why we needed to stand up against it. And then, you know, I said a few words toward the end. And at the end of this meeting, you know, four or five of us gathered, it's very similar to church, the folks who linger at the end, the ones who really get connected and you really get to see and get to know and really learned, you know, who was invested in this for the long term, right? Who, who really wanted to be there. So you have my family, which is seven folks in and of itself, plus five more, and we got a good crowd. And so leaders of Boxtown Neighborhood Association and the Walker Homes West Junction Neighborhood Association, our state representative, you know, all started to kind of congeal around, like, we're going to have to do something. Full disclosure, none of us knew how to beat a pipeline. None of us, I, I personally hadn't had a whole lot of work in organizing thousands of people, communities of people during a pandemic to fight two multi-billion dollar corporations. We were not equipped with that and we'll talk about this, how partnerships and relationships help to really launch this even further than we thought it could ever get to, or, or we thought it would. But recognizing it was that day in October 2020 that helped to really transform history uh, itself. And I just want to emphasize, underline a couple things you said. It's been really shocking to see a couple of things in this story. And one is that it wasn't until December 2019 that Plains All American said, we're coming through Boxtown, mm -hmm. and then held some open houses in January and February 
that were not very well publicized, very lightly attended, and it was all good, don't worry, opportunity, mm -hmm. and also started reaching out to a couple dozen landowners in the neighborhood and saying, look, you might as well sign an easement and we'll pay mm -hmm. you a little money because if you don't, we're going to take your property through eminent domain mm -hmm. and it is a done deal and there's nothing you can do about it and none of your elected officials are talking about this. And that attitude seems to go on for the next seven or eight, nine, ten months. And there isn't much news coverage except this is just kind of happening and that's it. And the Boxtown Neighborhood Association had even invited the company to come to meetings and they had said no throughout the summer. And then, as you said, there was a reporter who dug in a little more, got a little more attention, a little more heat. And some of y'all started finding each other on the internet from as far away as Nashville somehow, and then ended up calling this rally together kind of virtually, this is the pandemic. It's a real rally in person. And then five of you at the end of this rally which is still just one rally and the city's elected representatives, nobody's saying anything really. Mm. And there's five of you that decide to start a new organization and are saying, well, no, we're going to turn this around. We're going to change this story from everyone in the world thinks it's a done deal. And it's even telling many of us that we shouldn't waste our time. Like, and these are people we love who are our neighbors mm -hmm. and y'all are going to start a new organization. And you just said, you don't know how to stop a pipeline. But our social movements have also shown that we don't know how to stop pipelines. We have not a great record over the last 10, 12 years. So here you are, but you're getting attention, getting traction. There's five of you. And what do you all do next through the fall? Yeah, it's a really helpful point. So one of the things that we wanted to do is to gather as much information as possible. Uh, the pipeline company had years uh, ahead of us, right? They'd been doling out money to people and trying to solicit support in that way. And so we had to gather information. And one of the things that was really important for us was, look, we, we want to make sure that we know as much as anyone so that we could be like the primary drivers of the movement. And so that took a lot of conversations with people in Boxtown and took a lot of conversations with people in different parts of the city. Our friends at Protect Our Aquifer had attended a lot of those meetings that the pipeline company had held, recorded a couple of them as well. And so we were pretty intentional about gathering information. The other thing was finding points of resistance. There was aquatic resource alteration permit. We put in an appeal against that with the help of Breach Collective, and those are our first coalition partners and our attorneys. We became our attorneys in the fight who helped us to write an appeal. And then we were like, okay, let's keep learning. Let's keep finding the places where we're able to push, right? Where we're able to potentially stop, where we're able to resist. And then we learn more about this group called the Southern Environmental Law Center, who become our attorneys. And in talking with them, we learn more about eminent domain. And so what happens in the fall, part of what happens is we're starting to learn more about how people's land is being taken, learning about the laws of eminent domain, trying our best to find impact of people. As with any good movement, it is only going to be as good as those who are being affected are engaged. That is a requirement of any social justice movement. Any good work is that those who are most proximate are the folks who power the movement. And so we're learning about eminent domain. We're, we're fighting aquatic resource alteration permits. And we're realizing that we need people who are more proximate. We had a couple dozen people who were very interested, who had been passionate, Folks like Van Rutherford, you know, I'm talking to him on the phone. He runs a group of senior citizens who care about the, the public parks, right? Like we're, we're doing what we can to talk to folks. But it wasn't until that December rally where, yes, it was the pandemic. We were attempting to keep folks physically distant, have hand sanitizer, have masks, things of this sort, where we create a public forum for this conversation. Um, there hadn't been any public forums. The only way we would be able to spread the word out, uh, as far as we understood, was to be able to gather folks, uh, which was scary. There's no vaccine. Uh, people are dying, especially in our community, black communities, especially in communities where asthma rates are high, our communities. Uh, but the risk uh, of not getting this message out there, informing people about what was going on and educating them about the risk of this pipeline project and helping them to become advocates themselves to our elected leaders was much worse, honestly, than what could have happened. 
And so one of the things that we did at this rally was set the framing for people, inform people about what was going on. And the next was to actually open the floor. We wanted the community to speak, not just Justin, not just Kimberly Pearson or Jason Pearson or Keyshawn Pearson, right? Not just our co-founders. We wanted to hear from the community. And so we opened the floor and a little bit of everybody started talking. And as with any public forum, you kind of got to be ready for whomever shows up and allow them the, the space, right? To take up the space physically and in, in voice. And uh, the last person to speak is Marie Odom in her red sweater. She gets up and she has paper in her hand and she's telling us the story about Mr. Clyde Robinson and his land that Bahia Connection Pipeline is suing him for. They're trying to take it because he refuses to give it over to them. And her voice, all the things that led up to her even finding out about the event from the president of the Roxtown Neighborhood Association, Ms. Marcella Shepard, who she was connected to because she was driving around Boxtown and just asked people about the pipeline project. And if anybody was resisting and a random group of men told her to go find Marcella, gave her Marcella's address and she went up there, right? Like all these acts of God, divine intervention that bring Marie to the rally in December transforms the movement because now we're not just fighting two multi-billion dollar companies and fighting against them, trying to get our congressmen and our two mayors and our state representatives, and state senators to resist our city council and our county commission. Now we're not just fighting against something, we're fighting for someone. We're fighting for Mr. Clyde Robinson, right? 80 year old black gentleman. We're fighting for his grandkids, you know, like Omari and his daughter, like Marie. And that's a pivotal change in the direction that we continue to go forward. And so throughout the fall, after meeting them in December, at our first rally, we're beginning conversations with Amanda Garcia and George Nolan about eminent domain. And they tell us more people have been sued. And we really get to work looking people up on Facebook. I go in the car with my mom to people's houses in the rain, knocking on doors like, hey, did you know you've been sued? Or, hey, there's some help available. And that was one of the things I told Mr. Robinson after that rally. I said, we're going to get you a lawyer. Although I, I, I didn't have a lawyer that we could get him. <laughs> but I believed, I believed we were going to get him a lawyer. And thankful to George Nolan for connecting to Scott Cross because we eventually did. But, you know, telling people we're going to get them support if they are willing and wanting to resist. And that's ultimately how we get connected to Scotty Fitzgerald through a cousin of Kathy Robinson, who's a good friend, obviously, and, and, and leader of the movement. And the momentum starts to build because now we're fighting for someone. We're not just fighting against this terrible project. And we take that into the new year of 2021, too. That must have been a really great feeling to be just all these people joining together, finding each other, finding we have you have a stake in this fight. I got a stake in this fight. I feel really passionately about defending the neighborhood, even though maybe I don't live in the neighborhood anymore. Or maybe my family does. Or it that, wasn't it just a fight about the people just in the neighborhood by people who had a connection or felt a connection. That's in addition exactly right. to, it sounds like, you know, Protect Our Aquifer is not a group of people who are from the neighborhood or traditionally fighting alongside, it's, you know, African-Americans, Black people of any kind in Memphis mm -hmm. is my understanding. That's right. But you start to build this multiracial, multi-class coalition mm -hmm. that also includes people who are, trying to figure out how to change the story, trying to figure out what are the legal angles? How do we work together respectfully? Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit more about what that collaboration was like? Yeah. So in fact, the way we got introduced to the Southern Environmental Law Center was through Protect Our Aquifer. The way we got introduced to the Breach Collective was through a connection I'd had in college. Again, this was a white young woman that I had connected with in college. And asked, like, hey, can you help me with this environmental fight on, like, LinkedIn or something? And she'd found it. And so think of that, right? Like, two white folks really help us to connect with who becomes our first coalition partner, even though they're out in Portland, Oregon, and the Southern Environmental Law Center, who become 
the lawyers of this movement and of this fight. And so it's a good, really helpful point here. In addition to making sure that we have our people power proximity, it's been really an intentional effort. It was an intentional effort to make sure we had partners who were bringing a lot of different stakeholders into the conversation. The truth is, folks in Boxtown have been screaming for a while and in Westwood, right, saying they didn't want this project to happen. People have been raising their voice saying, you know, this isn't a good idea. We don't like this. We don't think the benefits are real or they're fabricated, or these types of things, but they weren't being listened to. And it wasn't until after that October meeting where now the state senator, the state representative is starting to listen. That's really helpful. But you don't really have the ear of the congressperson. Neither of the mayors have said anything. No leaders of the city council, no leaders of the county commission, even those who represent the district, completely silent. As the movement grows, people in the community start to continue to drive the conversation, continue to be the source of inspiration, motivation, engagement. But we bring in an element of different power, just a different level of power. That's what Heather McGee in her book, The Some of Us, calls uh, building the solidarity dividend. And building a cross-racial, cross-class movement is how victories are won. Whether you think about the abolition movement, you think a lot about the civil rights movement, it requires people who might otherwise be separate or view themselves as separate from the fight, joining it in order for us to win. And so you have Protect Our Aquifer, which is nearly 100% white of an organization and middle class to upper class board members and people actively engaged who some are retired and so they have more time or energy. Some of them have PhDs or doctorate degrees who are choosing a social location with folks in our community, in Boxtown, folks who might not have had access to the same opportunities, who are not being listened to or would not be listened to in the same way. And finding that by interconnecting our stories, recognizing that if we allow the pipeline to go through Southwest Memphis, uh, the potential for it to contaminate our water is quite severe. We know there are breaches in the clay layer, for instance. If we allow people who are already oppressed to continue to be oppressed, the effects of that don't live just with those who are being oppressed initially. You poison the water, it might start to be poisoned in Southwest Memphis, but water doesn't have a point or a place where it says, here's the black part of town, here's the poor part of town. It'll hurt us worse, but it'll hurt everyone. And getting people to realize in a loving yet self-interested way that what happens to people who are most oppressed, what happens to people who are most marginalized does have serious implications for you too. And I think them bringing what was quite literally a level of knowledge about the aquifer that we did not know. Now we've got people all up and down South Memphis talking about the aquifer, right? We didn't really understand that in the same way before we knew we had the best water in the world. Didn't really know why. I knew it was sweet. Didn't really know why, but we learned, right? And they were able to bring some technical expertise in addition to their personhood and their, their social location, which was a little bit more well-connected and had a lot more resources and so when we built a movement that looked more like a diverse Memphis, looked more like people who are most excluded leading the conversation, it actually changed people's listening, right? People couldn't look at the movement the same way uh, as is often written off when you just see indigenous folks marching. They're like, well, those, those people's issues. When you just see black folks marching, well, there's just those issues. When you just see white folks marching, well, there's just those issues. But when you have a diverse group of people from different parts of the city, Ultimately, eventually, it will become different parts of the country who are all raising the same issue about environmental racism, environmental injustice, environmental degradation, risking drinking water, stilling of land. It changes the narrative and says that this community that you thought was alone, that can be picked on, that was a point of least resistance, is not that. It is a place of resilience, but it's also a rebirth or a birth of something even more beautiful and more profound it is the birth of a multiracial, multi-class movement that is going to help to shape and reshape the narratives so that we can create real and sustainable change. And that sounds great. And here you are coming into January, February, with more people in the neighborhood, outside the neighborhood, connected, keeping each other's spirits up, inspired, want to fight, have lawyers, still don't know if you can 
get the leverage to stop the pipeline? Can we find the legal argument? It looked to me like city of Memphis council members, some of them starting to pay attention, not necessarily from the, like who represented the neighborhood, but even others, but still not real clear action and not clear if they can really do anything about it. February, the Army Corps of Engineers at the federal level approves the pipeline permit. So you could still be saying this is a done deal. Not only that, but the pipeline for a year had had on contract a former NAA, local NAACP leader as a spokesperson mm-hmm. and had given out over a million dollars to 26 different Memphis organizations, including the local NAACP chapter. Mm-hmm. So you could both make the case that Y'all got some momentum. And by the way, shout out to y'all who also were canvassing to turn people out door to door for city council meetings in sub freezing temperatures. Not a thing that happens many places, but especially not a brand new all volunteer organization. So we could argue you got momentum and you're clearly able to motivate each other through sub zero canvassing, but you also don't yet have any political wins at your back, still not sure how we can stop this. And then we go into March and it seems like things start to turn and the next phase starts. And so what starts to happen? Yeah. So once we've got attorneys, we've got a couple of people politically. After that January meeting is when, God bless him, he's our champion on the city council, Dr. Jeff Warren really joins in the fight, arguing for a resolution that says the city council is against the Bahia Connection Pipeline, which garners some more attention and support, which I'll get into here. Our congressman shows up in person for that rally and says that he wants to stay engaged and actually support us. He writes letters to the Army Corps of Engineers, in fact, even after its decision of permitting the Bahia Connection Pipeline. And side note, the Nationwide Permit 12 is being reviewed in part because of the Bahia connection fight, and they wrote that in the note. And the county mayor was at that January rally. The next one would be completely virtual in February because we experienced a snowstorm unlike anything we've ever experienced. And this is where divine intervention plays a, a role in how we, one, we have to boil water for the first time in Memphis history. A boil water advisory is sent out to the entire community it says that if you drink the water, you can get sick. What? The best water in the world is at risk by the weather. And now we want to risk a pipeline going through it, right? Like the company that is building the pipeline had a flare off of historic proportions that sent all types of toxic fumes in the air during this, during this winter storm. And so we started to have incidences happening that raise the specter of like, is the best idea for us to actually risk our drinking water, right? When for a week we had to boil it and it became nearly unbearable to think that, well, wait a second, I can't brush my teeth with that. Wait a second, I I can't, I can't eat with that. And our brothers and sisters across Jackson to Flint to Baltimore are experiencing this now in, in 2022. And we were forced by time itself and climate change itself to think about those questions. And all of this propels the conversation forward. We have another rally that has to turn completely virtually because we can't go outside because of the level of snow that that, that was out there. And two city council members who'd never shown up to anything before show up, right? And, and the conversation about this resolution, we need to pass a resolution from the city council and we want it to pass, right? You, you don't want to suffer losses in the movement. Losses are very difficult to come back from, though it is possible. The first uh, fight that I remember is, is at Standing Rock, right? Fighting against fossil fuel infrastructure. And that seed, even though I didn't realize it, germinated so many years later in our fight within my own experience. And so losses aren't always losses in the way that we think about it. They can be something that can propel the, the, the fight forward, which is what we want ultimately. And our partnerships are growing. We go from Memphis Community Against the Pipeline and the Breach Collective and Southern Environmental Law Center and Protect Our Aquifer and Tennessee Sierra Club to a larger group, which includes folks like the Climate Reality Project. And we get folks in Memphis on board and we get this gentleman uh, in New York on board. We have Duffy Marie in Memphis and Tim Guinea in New York. And he says, I have a crazy idea. 
what if we got Al Gore to come to Memphis? Right? Like Al Gore, former vice president of the United States, Al Gore, the leader of Climate Reality Project to come to Memphis and like talk about this issue. And I'm just like, wait, what? It's like, okay, we've got this this legislation being pushed. I was like, I think this is good timing, right? Like, let's try and make let's try and make it happen. And so that coalition, right, that echo that started, uh, that whisper that started in Boxtown that starts to echo, gets echoed all the way up to Vice President Al Gore. And we're now saying we are right on our arguments. We, we believe that there is something that can be done locally, despite all the local governments at first saying there was nothing they could do. Thanks for, to our entire team, we found there were some local things that could be done. The federal government didn't care about drinking water. The state government didn't care about drinking water, but it could be protected at the local level. Great. And so we started to figure out that our arguments got stronger and our, our, our arguments against eminent domain got stronger. We realized and still believe that private companies don't have the right to eminent domain to take people's land for private gain. Our attorneys are going to court and we're bringing 50 and 60 people to every court case on Zoom from the from the neighborhood, right? And they're introducing themselves. Oh, I'm I'm Justin J. Pearson. I'm living in Westwood. Oh, I'm, I'm uh, Esther Knox. I'm an Easter Knox and I live in Boxtown. We're seeing the, the, the legal strategy catching up to the political strategy, catching up to the social justice strategy. And we get support, right? From a former vice president coming into the neighborhood, coming into Westwood, right? You're talking about one of the most segregated neighborhoods in Memphis, Tennessee, one of the poorest communities. And a former vice president is there saying this pipeline project is reckless, right? Is racist and a ripoff. Momentum is shifting. And the national attention is coming. We have CBS News meeting with Mr. Clyde Robinson and Mrs. Scotty Fitzgerald, another landowner in Boxtown, whose mother bought that land at a time black women couldn't really own land, whose voices are being heard on Gail King's show. Right? Something is substantively changing because people never stopped believing that we could win. That belief, supported by these other pillars, which are quite important, those court cases, really important. Our ability as MCAP to join the court cases of Mr. Robinson and Mrs. Fitzgerald, super important. The national attention. So just to summarize what, what you're saying about, so there is this dominant story, oh, it's a done deal. It probably isn't going to be too risky. And then there's, there's an actual climate event that happens that hurts them being able to tell that story. Oh, we have a fragile ecosystem. Here's a big reminder of that. But also, it's hard to keep telling that story if another story that keeps getting told is, even if it's just three or so landowners, which is, I think, about how many were actively supporting the campaign of a lot more. But they just kept telling, you guys got their stories told over and over in different venues by different, now national. It helped to get a spotlight from some national figures not just Al Gore, but it looks like Mark Ruffalo, Danny Glover, other people yeah. sort of like giving you online shout outs and support. Right. So it's harder and harder for the done deal to be the story if it's, well, wait a second, these people, and even one of the landowners said they were being deceived. Mm -hmm. Plains All-American is suing 10 of them. The thing I want to slow down too is y'all convinced the judge to let Memphis Community Against the Pipeline, your grassroots organization, mm -hmm. represent the community and landowners mm -hmm. so they didn't all have to be in court you could also bring people with you and mm -hmm. bring 40 or 50 people and even got them introduced and the opening roll call would just be your 40 or 50 people in a court case. That's unprecedented, unheard of, but you all just made yourselves really hard to ignore. Of course, there are things that are like, oh, that's an event that we couldn't have predicted, but also just kept the drumbeat going, even though going into March, now April, there's lawsuits that y'all are filing and it's not clear if they're going to work. And the other thing I think that we should mention for people yeah. trying to track this story into the final phase mm -hmm. now is that you got the city council and the county commission to pass a totally toothless resolution opposing the pipeline. It just mm -hmm. said, we're opposed to this, which is still something, right? They had not done that yet. And we are now a year and a half into this, basically. Mm -hmm. So they're at least now saying, if there's a way to stop this, it should be stopped. And then... What's what's next? What's the next phase? You're calling to my remembrance so many things. And I probably should write this timeline down because there's a point where we're fighting at the county commission to prevent the sale of land to Bahalia Connection Pipeline, which becomes equally important. To your point, let me 
just slow back just a little bit. Mr. Clyde Robinson and Ms. Scotty Fitzgerald become centerpieces of the campaign because we have to keep those, again, who are most proximate to the pain as the leading voices and faces. We were fighting not just a cause because it was right or against a pipeline because it was bad, but for people who were experiencing an injustice, people's land, people's familial ancestry, right? And so in a lot of different forms and a lot of different places, they kept being willing. And they're older, amazing folks, but they got tired too, right? Not tired necessarily of telling their story but tired of having to tell their story, wondering when this would be over. And they kept going, right? They kept showing up. And so it's really important in campaigns that we find the folks who are impacted and we continue to allow them to tell their truth because that truth resonated and it continues to resonate and reverberate now. I I don't like the Bahia Connection Pipeline and I got a family out of the struggle. And the Robinson family, the Fitzgerald family, we've been to funerals together. We've been to graduations together. We have built a family and connection beyond just that fight into into the present day. And so I appreciate slowing down there. In court, it was the genius of our team of attorneys at this point to figure out a way for the community to be represented. Because the case while led by Mr. Robinson and Mrs. Scotty Fitzgerald, they always represented more than just themselves. I've talked to landowners who sold their land and they'll tell you they sold it because times are tough. It's the pandemic. I didn't understand the consequences of it. I didn't realize what the effects were and I wish I could take it back. That's what people will say to you today if you call them. I wish I could take that back. I didn't realize what it was going to do. And so Mr. Robinson and Ms. Fitzgerald always represented more than just themselves, right? They represented all of us, all of South Memphis, all of Memphis, all of Shelby County, and hundreds and thousands of people who've been disenfranchised nationally, historically. And the opportunity for MCAP to intervene in the lawsuits and in their cases was just make it manifest what they embodied already. And so thankful for our attorney, George Nolan, at Southern Environmental Law Center, Scott Crosby, at Bridgeport and Johnson as well because they were able to orchestrate this as part of our strategy that, you know what? Everybody's water is going to be polluted. Everybody's land is going to be at risk for some private company to be able to take it. All of us are going to be very, very much so worse off. And that deserves a chance to speak in court. And Judge Felicia Corbin Johnson, who is a very fair judge, agreed that this issue was bigger than just the few landowners who were with MCAP or other landowners who were being sued and have refused to, to sell their, their land or property to Bihalia. This voice, this attention, this awareness, it does have a connection to things that do happen politically. And so it's a toothless resolution in its, in its actual sense, but in its movement sense, right? We got a lion's mouth and like a shark's, all of its teeth, right? Like we, this is huge because we've been marching from the civil rights museum to city hall. We've been delayed several times, even a vote on these resolutions. They had to be altered and changed and revised. I learned a lot about local government and God bless our movement. All my videos being like, okay, got delayed again and delayed again. And delayed again, but like it's going to pass one day. And so we are experiencing the opportunity there, like seeing this get passed, seeing our city take a stand. And then the moment of truth came with our county commission when they had land that Bahalia literally wanted to buy. God bless Ayanna Hampton. I didn't even know who she was, who found this out. She reached out to a county commissioner, Commissioner Tammy Sawyer. Commissioner Tammy Sawyer had a meeting with us that was pre-planned before we knew any of this. We had already had it on calendar. And she said, y'all need to focus on this. It was Thursday. Okay. The vote's Monday. Ignite the entire movement toward not selling land. And it's the moment of truth for our county commission to say, are you on the pipeline side or the people side? And overwhelmingly in a supermajority, I think it was a nine to two vote, including with Republicans and Democrats. They said, we're on the people side. We're on the protection of the folks' land. We're on the protection of our water. We're on the protection of our community. And that, again, buoys the movement as it moves forward. Now, we're up against an indefinite timeline 
And as movement organizers and people in this work, that is scary because you don't know they got the permits, right? They, they, they have all these things. They don't have one essential permit locally, which is important, which is a permit to cross city streets, which our mayor's office and the mayor's attorney is extraordinary. We're holding until we had more information, all these other things, but they got most of the permits. There are maybe 90% there. We're up against a timeline of them being able to start. They literally have advertisements about them getting the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers approval and ability to start construction. Whew. Can I say that they're also scared because at the same time, this is April, May 2021, they get the American Petroleum Institute, I love this, to start a grass tops email campaign yes. to counter you guys that they named Citizen Energy, Cit Energy Citizen. Yeah. and But it's like they're not even hiding it. It's literally the out of town petroleum institute is yep. trying to get people to email the city council to slow down and back this pipeline. And I'm curious, is this also when you all landed on this ordinance idea of banning pipelines within a certain fee mm -hmm. of schools, houses? It's interesting because another campaign story we're hearing this season is where they used exactly this tactic in Philadelphia to mm -hmm try to keep casinos out. So I'm wondering if you could say, because you, you've talked a little bit about what mm -hmm. the engagement was with city and county elected officials. Mm -hmm. so how did you all figure that out? Yeah, yeah, no, that's super helpful. And there was another one called like Good Jobs for Memphis. I think in a weekend they spent, it eventually came out, they spent maybe $50,000 worth of ads. I was like, man, I wish we had $50,000, but it's okay. To your point with the electeds, right? So we realize that the there's no help coming, as it were, right? The federal government has abdicated responsibility for our protection. The state government has abdicated responsibility for our protection. The president doesn't look like he's going to intervene in this particular fight, although we learned that Vice President Gore told him about it. And locally, we're trying to figure out what options are available. And a lot of credit for at least one of the ordinances comes from our, our county mayor who said, how about we just protect home schools, churches, playgrounds from crude oil pipelines? And I talked with Alex Hensley, who was his special assistant about the crafting. And we get our lawyers about the crafting and say, that's a pretty good idea. And we really start to hone in on, okay, this is the type of legislation that it would do what we want it to, right? You can't have this type of infrastructure within, you know, 1500 feet of a school per se, or home or church. And it provides for some exceptions maybe, but you have to go through a process if that's something that you want to do. Similarly, we were thinking on the city council side, well, let's try to pass the exact same legislation that was not as effective, but there were other pieces that we were able to pass. Let's protect our wellhead overlay zones. For instance, the pipeline was planned to run through our drinking water well field. So that would have prevented this, this project from being passed. And why are these companies from out of state allowed to come into our town, into our cities, into our county without anybody's permission who doesn't live here, right? All permission is coming from Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation, federal government. They don't live in Memphis. They don't live in Shelby County. They don't live in Tennessee. They don't know what we're going through. So why is all the permissions that they need outside of the place impacted? And so another piece of legislation that was passed was to say, if you want to build that type of infrastructure in our city, you have to get permission from our city council to do it, which is the, the people as it were, as it should be, I will say. It takes several months to pass through the county commission. It takes even more months. In fact, after the pipeline fight is technically over and it has been canceled, it takes an additional three to four or five months for us to pass legislation at the city council. But the reality was like, where is it that we do have power locally? If their tactic is to disempower people locally, especially, and to use the permits that they're getting from outside, it is where do we have power and how do we use that? Folks know they have power when it comes to resolutions. It's a little harder to, to really push people who are afraid of lawsuits and things like this. But we were pushing. 
to say you do have power and you have an obligation, opportunity, and responsibility to the people in the community to fight for us. And that's where the impetus came and the support came from Jeff, Dr. Jeff Warren and from folks on the county commission side, Commissioner Sawyer and others who joined in to say, we need laws, right? There are real regulatory gaps when it comes to this fossil fuel infrastructure locally, and we need to mend those gaps, which have long-term benefits for environmental justice communities, but again, has long-term benefits for all of us. Even those who aren't living in the most polluted areas, who are living in more polluted areas than they otherwise would if communities were integrated, but there's long-term benefits if we actively work together to have legislation that protects all of the city and all the county. And you alluded to that happening, and that was one of the next phases, and you kind of skipped over the huge victory here that y'all didn't see coming necessarily, but it's into July and they're about to have a hearing on this ordinance that would probably kill the pipeline. And the pipeline company does what? And take us there. Yeah. Oh God. I just get happy. It's like, that was the happiest day of my life. So the week before the pipeline gets counseled, we have a rally, right? Cause we're, we in it, we don't know how long we're in this fight, but like we in it, we're about to go to court about eminent domain, about to get summary judgment on July 9th from judge Felicia Corbin Johnson about whether or not Plains all American and Valero energy corporation have the right to eminent domain, take people's land without their permission. And it's the same week that we have legislation going before the city council and the county commission. I believe we have both of them related to this pipeline project. One piece of legislation is to protect home schools, churches, playgrounds from pipelines, and the others to force permission to have to come from the city council. This is all coming in the next week. We're energizing our base. We have a rally before. And then the weekend of July 4th, it was July 2nd, 2021, I get a phone call from a city councilman, Dr. Jeff Warren, and he says the pipeline has been canceled. And the level of exuberation and gladness and joy and yelling and just like all of that washing over me and my great brother who was with me. And then my mom and I called and my dad and Jillian, our co-founder and everybody was just like disbelief. It was actually like, it wasn't relief necessarily. It was just like disbelief. Like, like we did this thing. Whew. I and, feel it. Thank yeah. you for sharing that feeling with us. It's really something. And we want to get into the lessons you got a few i think that we should unpack but if you could take us to where you all are now because you know a you actually did keep fighting like y'all didn't stop the campaign you got these ordinances passed yeah. affecting all future potential pipelines and similar infrastructure permitting and b even changed your name to memphis community against pollution yeah. not just pipelines c got into a fight with the state legislature and D already are in at least two other campaigns defending Memphis from environmental racism in much the same way. Can you bring us into in, like up to the present day and then we'll get into a couple of the lessons? Yeah, we wanted to use the momentum of the pipeline victory to keep the fight going. We knew that this pipeline project only revealed environmental racism. It didn't create it. And it revealed it on a scale that could not be ignored any longer. And so we knew that our fight would have to be beyond the pipeline in and of itself. But we also realized that the fight with the pipeline showed glaring gaps that could and needed to be filled locally. And so after the pipeline is canceled, there's a city council meeting and the, the folks on the pipelines team, they showed up and they immediately said, we're canceling this project, but... We don't want any laws passed. Well, if you are done with us, why does it matter what we're doing locally? And so that was a shot across the bow for us to say like, look, we really need to keep pressing and keep forcing this issue. And so we took the momentum of the victory and we turned that people power into a push for legislative changes at the county commission and at the city council. And we worked and negotiated and negotiated and worked between corporations and community groups and different lawyers and different personalities, as you know, that exists in the movement to pass three laws in Memphis City and Shelby County 
that are still good law and on the books using the momentum from the pipeline fight. Uh, what ultimately happened, right? Like you, you win a victory and then folks come after it. And in our supermajority Republican legislature, that's exactly what happened. We expected it to happen, didn't know when, didn't necessarily know how, but it was unfortunately someone who lives locally in one of the suburbs, Representative Kevin Vaughn of Collierville, who perpetuates environmental racism and injustice and wanted to give pipeline companies carte blanche opportunity to run through and roughshod over people, especially black lower income people across our state. And they pushed legislation forward that would cut public opinion and public comment and localities' ability to resist pipeline and fossil fuel projects and allow even out-of-state or foreign companies to have more of a voice in pipeline permitting and projects than we do as people. So we went to Nashville three or four times helping to elevate this. We went once and they didn't even speak about it. And so we had to come back, but we came back with more people. And we not only defended the laws that we had in Memphis, we elevated the issue to such a point that people across the state, including in some smaller towns that look a whole lot different than Memphis, and I assure you probably vote different than people in Memphis vote, who said, look, you can't take all of our power away. You can't strip all of our power away. And while that law ultimately got passed, we got three amendments in there that helped to strengthen our positions within it. And in a supermajority Republican legislature that is the type that will burn and ban books, our ability to get that law changed and to get it delayed enough in order for us to change it and, and input from our lawyers to be included in some ways turned it from most horrific and terrible law into something that's just pretty bad. And our job, right, is to continue to defend as best we can against the forces of evil that, that are existing, that are against our will. What's disappointing locally, we got people across the aisle to see what was good for everybody. But what happened in Nashville was corporate money telling people how to think and what to think. And unfortunately, the people in the quote unquote leaders, a lot of the leaders, quote unquote leaders in Nashville, accepted that status quo. And can you just quickly tell us where you all are at with the new campaign that you're fighting yeah. and how this one led to that one? Yeah. So about midway through the fight against the pipeline, our attorneys told us it's going to be important that we incorporate it. And we wanted to have a name that would last beyond the pipeline fight. And it was clear. They said, but something's going to happen with the pipeline, right? And you don't want to be existing only about that. And so we wanted to keep MCAP, which is our grassroots name, and got into a conversation about what P should we change to and what issue were we working on beyond the pipeline fight, and it became pollution. And so when we beat the pipeline, we were able to really officially go into our name being Memphis Community Against Pollution. That is a recognition that there's a lot of pollution. And the air and the water and the soil in Memphis and Shelby County, that has gone unaddressed for decades because of who it's impacting, not because of how terrible it is, because people know how terrible it is, but it's, well, that's, that's just impacting poor people, all right? That's just impacting black folks. And so now we're dedicated to helping to elevate the issues of toxic air and, and of toxic pollution that's happening. I think there's so many lessons already that those of us listening to your story could pick up even without you pointing them out about what to do when it feels like the world thinks we're down and out. Maybe we feel like that too, or some parts of us do, even though the other part is canvassing at sub-zero temperatures, getting people out to city council meetings where we don't even know if we have the power to win the thing we need to win. There's a lot that's in there. I feel honored that y'all you're sharing it with us. What do you think other organizers should take away from this, this campaign story? Look, we have to center folks who are most excluded and marginalized in the fight. We have to center people who are most impacted. That voice, that perspective, that guidance, that leadership leads us to victory. The status quo is to silence those very voices those who are being told that they're powerless or that they're voiceless. No person is powerless. Everyone is intrinsically powerful. No person 
is voiceless. Everyone has a voice, whether it's heard, whether it is signed, whether it is written, everybody has a voice and we have the responsibility of finding the way to hear it and to help elevate it if we are in places and positions of privilege to do so, which connects to that solidarity dividend. No movement in American history has been effective if only one particular group of people were it, right? The end all and the be all. It's proven more diverse groups lead to better outcomes. In social justice, it is going to be a group that is racially diverse, economically diverse, knowledge-wise diverse, right? That helps us to win. It isn't going to be a room full of people with just PhDs who have all the statistics and have all the right graphs. It isn't just going to be the room of lawyers who are all really smart and went to all these great schools that's going to do it. And it isn't just going to be a room of people who are, have been hurt and oppressed and are screaming for help. And it certainly isn't going to be just a room of politicians talking to polluters who are going to save us. It is going to be the development intentionally of relationships with people who are impacted and those who may not view themselves as directly impacted, but who have an interest in the cause of justice, whether that is self-interested or communal interest, or it's a long-term interest in future generations having a better future that we have to tap into. And it's by having black folks and white folks and rich folks and poor folks that makes our coalition near indestructible. That intersection, those intersections make it really, really hard to unweave us. And so when we say we're, we're stronger together, we're more powerful together, we are undefeatable together. This is definitely not easily broken. And so those are a couple of lessons that I, I hope to leave folks with. And, and like, other thing is like, we are human and we will get fatigued, right? Like every day isn't always a good day. I cried every week, almost every day of the campaign. Honestly, right? I didn't make a whole lot of new friends per se outside of the movement. It was difficult. And so it's recognizing your humanity and keeping the spirit, right? Our spirits are not destructible, right? They can't be broken. They can't be bent. They can't be bowed down. And our spirits, when we win, our spirits, when we lose, are indestructible and they will continue to propel forward. And the beauty of the movement is really just the amount of spirits that keep showing up on good days, on bad days, and throughout, and that we have to continue to foster as well. That's great. I really appreciate you sharing those lessons and insights. Last question, just mm -hmm. if there's another wish that you have for us or an insight you want to make sure that we absorb or another offering, any last thoughts? Be intentional also about expressing gratitude. I try to do this so much more now to even my own family, my mother who gave that riveting speech that October day that helped me to give my speech uh, to our co-founders, Jillian, and Kathy, Kizzy, to Boxtown and to Westwood and Walker Homes. Right? We have to be grateful for each other because that also reminds us of our worth as people, that we deserve clean air, we deserve clean water. We deserve to have lives that live in communities and environments that are just. I would stick to having a grateful heart for the people who are in the struggle, who are suffering, but who are in it with you. Because that's who you're going to need and that's who we're going to lean on and I'm going to be leaning on into the future. I think as a parting word of wisdom is we are right. We are right. Every polluting company, every politician in their pocket, everyone who skews the truth against the cause of justice, they are wrong. I do not know how long we will be in this fight. I imagine a lifetime. I don't know how many more wins we're going to have or how many losses, but we are right. And so in the end, just as the arc is long and time is long itself, we will win. And so keep going. And I'm going to be with you. Thank you. It's a great place to end. Justin J. Pearson, thank you again for joining us on the Craft Campaign. Good luck and 
lots of good wishes for the next phase of the fights out there in my hometown. Thank you so yeah. much, Andrew. I appreciate this. And just a note, if you appreciate this story and want it to get out to more people fighting their landlords, bosses, and politicians who just don't seem to care about things like pipelines in our backyard, leave us a rating and a review to help us take collective action on the recommendation algorithm. The Craft of Campaigns podcast is a project of the Organizing Skills Institute, a training for change and made possible by grassroots donors. Visit Training for Change for workshops, training tools, and other resources. We welcome your feedback and nominations for other campaigns that should be featured on this podcast. If you like these episodes, please consider donating to keep the show running. This podcast is produced by Ali Roseberry-Polier. I'm Andrew Willis-Garces. See you next time.